As an officer of the Army Medical Corps, I wish to bring your attention to an important phase in the preservation of your health. What you are about to hear and see is of such vital importance to every one of you, both as an individual and as a member of the armed forces of the United States, that you must give it your very closest attention. The matters we are about to discuss are at first glance every day and commonplace. The rules of conduct we shall suggest will seem to many of you mere matters of common sense. Do not let this deceive you into believing that they are therefore of minor importance. The application of common sense is, as a matter of fact, rather uncommon in human conduct. What you're about to see, if ignored, may lead to extremely serious consequences. But carefully observed will mean your health, your well-being, and the health and well-being of the men with whom you associate. The United States Army, as you all know, has undergone an enormous growth. We are assembling large numbers of men from all parts of the country, from every walk of life. Joining us in this vast program are men young, strong, and healthy. Before their induction into the Army, they have been given careful physical examinations and have been found physically fit for the service of their country. Sometimes we find a few whose previous ideas on personal hygiene are not adaptable to this new life of close association with other men. These scenes show the experience you all went through as you made the change from civilian to army life. You put off your civilian clothes. You were given a physical checkup in order to determine your fitness for the service of your country. You were carefully fitted for uniforms and your shoe sizes were given special attention since marching is to play a considerable part in your new life. Warm and well-made clothing was issued to you along with the equipment to keep yourselves clean and presentable. You dressed yourselves in your new uniforms and came out of the reception building looking somewhat different from the men who went in. Holy mackerel, are we soldiers already? Sure, you're in uniform, ain't you? Come on, let's go upstairs to the bunkhouse or whatever they call it and get rid of some of this stuff. Shindig going on someplace. Nah, they're just dopes. They think it's Saturday. One of the primary requirements expected of a soldier is cleanliness. And upon that, the whole theory of health and hygiene is based. Personal hygiene deals with the precautions we must take to protect ourselves from sickness. As soldiers, we live and work closely together and must go wherever and whenever military conditions require. Under these circumstances, you're exposed in some degree to more diseases than in civilian life. However, due to regular living habits and the good physical condition required before you become a soldier, plus the opportunity you have in the service to keep in good condition, we will, with your cooperation, be able to minimize the cases of illness and disease among you. If at any time you do not feel well, report at once to the first sergeant or charge of quarters who will enter your name in the sick book and send you to a medical officer for examination. Self-treatment is dangerous and unnecessary in the army as medical care is provided at no expense to you. The danger of giving the disease you may be developing to your associates is generally greatest when your illness is just beginning and often before you feel very ill. Stay away from any soldier who is sick unless it is your duty to take care of him. Most diseases are caused by germs, which gain entrance into your body in one of the following manners. Through the mouth, by eating food, or drinking liquids containing germs. Through the nose, by breathing germs which flow through the air. Through the skin, by bites of mosquitoes and other insects which breed in refuse. 
and by contact with persons suffering from disease or who may be carrying the contagion all right you men strip down and line up for medical inspection what again straighten out that footlocker company commander's inspection right after medical officer men I want to stress the necessity of keeping yourselves physically clean if you want to stay healthy. An unclean body is a disease breeder. Particularly, wash your hands with soap and water before each meal and after using the latrine. All right, men. The penis is examined to check against the presence of venereal diseases. We must guard also against vermin, which may lodge in the pubic hair or infest the body. Crabs, lice, ticks, or fleas. The crab louse can produce more discomfort than any of the other body infesting vermin. Though he is not as dangerous as the flea, who is a carrier of the deadly bubonic plague and of typhus fever. The common body louse, or cootie, is also a vehicle for the transmission of typhus, as well as trench fever and relapsing fever. The tick can also infect you with the relapsing fever, as well as tularemia or rabbit fever, and with the generally fatal Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Get your hair cut. Yes, sir. Barbers employed on military reservations are required to undergo a monthly physical inspection and to submit to any other test that may be necessary to ensure freedom from disease. These barber shops are frequently examined by the medical officer and are therefore the most sanitary and safest places to secure your barber work. You must keep your hair short and shampoo it frequently. The entire body should be bathed daily whenever circumstances permit, whether in garrison or in the field. Pay particular attention to your armpits, crotch, and feet. Be sure you wash and dry thoroughly between the toes because this is where athlete's foot usually develops. If foot baths are provided, step into the solution as you see here and remain for one minute, going both to and from the shower. Another matter of vital importance is the care of your teeth. Oh, I don't think you'll have any trouble now for a while. That is, if you improve your habits. You don't know how to brush your teeth. Or do you? Why, sure I do, sir. It does seem simple, doesn't it? Well, anyway, let's take a look and see how it's really done. Most people believe they're taking proper care of their teeth if they scrub them vigorously with a brush something like this. This may polish the surface of the teeth a little bit. That's not really why we brush teeth. Teeth are brushed in order to remove food particles that may have lodged between the teeth. Therefore, if you brush like this, the brush strokes vertically from the gums downward toward the cutting edge. Or in the case of the lower teeth, upward from the gums toward the cutting edge. This must be done both inside and out. And care must be given to the back teeth. If you have neglected your teeth, this manner of brushing might cause your gums to be sore for a day or two, but the health of your whole mouth will be greatly improved by the massaging action of the brush, strengthening the flesh of the gums. Now, some areas cannot be reached by the brush, and dental floss must be used. Hold this, please. Select a piece of floss about 10 inches long, then carefully work it between the teeth in this manner. Over the surfaces, between the teeth, until all the food or debris has been loosened and removed. Then pull the floss straight out between the teeth when you have finished. This string-like floss may also be purchased at your post exchange. This should take not less than three, four minutes of your time twice a day. Are cavities caused by leaving food between the teeth? Yes, that's one cause of cavities. If you come over here, I'll show you what happens. This shows you the structure of a tooth. On the outside, we see the enamel, one of the hardest substances nature produces. 
the main body of the tooth is made up of bony material called dentine and here in the center coming up through the roots we see the pulp or nerve it is this nerve that registers pain when you have a toothache now food large between the teeth or in the fissures of a molar is attacked by bacteria in the mouth which cause it to ferment this fermentation produces acids which are able to eat through the hard outer enamel and then attack the bony material of the tooth itself where decay proceeds very rapidly. If the decay proceeds so far that we can't cut it out with our instruments and fill the cavity without injuring the nerve, your tooth dies and has to be pulled. This usually means that the opposite tooth which bites on it deteriorates unless you have it replaced by a false tooth or bridge. If the tooth is not filled in time, an abscess may form like this. And the pus from the abscess may be distributed through the entire body. That may lead to all sorts of serious illnesses. Arthritis, rheumatism, impaired eyesight, heart disease, and kidney disease. Here we see another consequence of failing to clean the teeth carefully. Food and tartar deposits irritate the gum, causing it to withdraw from the tooth. This results in pyorrhea, in which the gum has become infected and the tooth becomes so loosened that it has to be removed. I suggest you use two toothbrushes, one for morning and one for night, so that each one may have a chance to dry thoroughly. This will keep the bristles stiff. Thank you very much, sir. And I'll be a good bit more careful from now on. If you require treatment, report to your charge of quarters, and we'll be glad to take care of you at no cost. Will you get in the chair, please? All that may be so, but my old man never brushed his teeth in his life. How about it, Sarge? Joe thinks I'm kidding about this tooth business. Steve's right, Joe. This hygiene stuff is legitimate. Nobody wants to get sick. And to stay healthy, all you gotta do is use your brains the way the Army does. See that fellow there? Well, what he's doing is all part of hygiene, too. We've all got a lot of germs in our system, see? Now, along comes a man and spits on the floor. Well, what happens? If you sweep the floor dry, the germs raise up in a cloud of dust, and somebody breathes them and maybe gets sick. So we use a wet sawdust to keep them down. Sometimes, Joe, you'll find a lot of things that don't seem to make sense. But in the Army, there's a reason for everything. And that goes with these hygiene regulations as much as anything. Even down to muffling your cough and a sneeze with your handkerchief, savvy? <laughs> that also goes for swapping harmonicas, cigarettes, pipes, gas masks, toilet articles, and things like that. Hey, give me a drag off your cigarette, will you, sir? So like I say, as you were... Here. Some rain. Hey, Mahaffey, get out of those wet clothes. What do you want to do? Get the flu? If you two ever get a set of stripes on your sleeves, you'll find you have to live with this book, especially on account of guys like Mahaffey. Here's what I mean. It says here. Wet clothing should be changed as soon as the opportunity permits. This is especially true of shoes and socks. Always try to avoid drafts if possible, especially while your clothing is still damp or when sweating. Soil clothing as well as bedding will be kept in your barracks bag if dry until opportunity arises for laundering. Wet clothing should be dried before so disposing of it. Underwear and shirts should be changed and washed at least twice a week. Bedding will be thoroughly aired and sunned at least once a week whether in garrison or in the field. Where laundry facilities are not available, clothing and bedding should be crumpled up, shaken well, and exposed to the sun for about two hours. Special attention should be given to the cleaning of your own mess gear. Food poisoning has been the result of eating from dirty dishes and mess kits. A container will be provided for the food left in your mess kit. Scrape all waste food from your mess kit into the refuse container. There will also be two changes of hot, soapy water and one of boiling, clear water. Wash your eating utensils thoroughly in the soapy water, then rinse thoroughly in the boiling, hot, clear water. Then fan them through the air until dry. Another important matter we must consider deals with the bodily functions. The human body is like a chemical separator. 
The food is absorbed into the stomach in much the same manner as we see here. It is then mixed with the gastric juice, dissolved and transformed into energy and waste products, both solid and liquid. The elimination of these waste products is naturally one of your body's most important jobs. Acquire the habit of having your bowels expel that waste regularly at least once every day, as near the same time as possible. Most barracks are equipped with a modern water carriage system, and it is only necessary to observe the same rules for cleanliness that you would in your own home. Do not soil the outside of the stools. Do not urinate on the seats or throw anything but toilet paper into the bowl. It is essential to keep your camp or barracks clean. As you have learned, diseases may be acquired by merely breathing the germs which float in the air. For this reason, proper ventilation is important to all of us. Germs and impurities are naturally more prevalent in dirty and poorly ventilated quarters. For instance, the air in this squad room is unquestionably foul. Yet when the windows are properly adjusted, the atmosphere clears and enables us to maintain our comfort and efficiency without drafts. Natural ventilation is readily obtained by opening a window at the bottom on one end of the room and another from the top on the other side. This is accomplished by rolling up the sides of the tent. At night, in barracks, direct drafts should be avoided by hanging clothing or shelter halves over a chair which is placed to deflect the draft from the bed end. Non-commissioned officers in charge of quarters should check the ventilation and temperature several times each night. If there is insufficient floor space to permit six feet between the heads of the beds, head-to-foot sleeping will provide extra space and prevent germs from being readily transmitted. Cubicles can also be made from shelter halves. They are fixed on either cots or beds, as you will note here. If an actual epidemic of colds or respiratory diseases occurs or threatens, cubicles will be provided for all the men even though there is more than average floor space in the squad room or tent. Whether in camps or barracks, flies and insects are a menace to health, since they also transmit germs to us. They breed in filth and decay of all sorts. So it is important that we prevent their breeding by giving particular attention to the care of garbage, latrines and manure. Refuse of food should not be thrown near the camp, as this material attracts flies. We are so accustomed to the daily sight of flies that many of us forget the criminal part they play as a threat to our health. Here we see an enlarged drawing of the common house fly. Note these little hairs which are invisible to the naked eye but form a perfect lodging place for the also invisible germ or bacteria which the fly spreads as he alights first on some infection breeding refuse, then upon our food, and upon our bodies and the utensils we use. The housefly spreads every type of intestinal disease. Roaches do not transmit diseases to men, but they are decided pests and are inclined to give a disagreeable odor to foods. Cleanliness is the first step in getting rid of roaches. They are thus prevented from obtaining food by not leaving scraps or refuse about the dining room or kitchen. Utensils should be kept free from grease. They should be washed with soap, rinsed in scalding hot water, and then be allowed to drain and air dry. These implements will be provided to enable you to destroy flies and insects in your quarters. Keep the screen doors and window screens closed. Lend a hand in destroying those insects which have already entered. I have already mentioned the mosquito. Some of you may know the part the United States Army played before the Panama Canal could be built by uncovering the means by which yellow fever and malaria are transmitted. The mosquito sticks this bayonet-like stinger, or proboscis, into your skin. The result may be nothing more than a troublesome, itchy swelling. However, if the mosquito's previous meal ticket had been a man suffering from yellow fever or malaria, he would certainly introduce the disease into your body. Besides malaria and yellow fever, mosquitoes transmit dengue fever, sometimes called breakbone fever or dandy fever, and filariasis, which may develop into elephantiasis. For this reason, you are provided with mosquito netting. Say, what's the point in this mosquito netting anyway, Joe? Keep out the mosquitoes. What do you think? 
Listen, genius, what I mean to say is why have we got them when we're not on tropical duty? How do you know we're not heading for Panama, Steve? Well, if we're heading for then Panama... shut up and help me put up this mosquito netting. This is the way it shows you to do it in the manual. The manual? What are you doing, studying now? Listen, if the Sarge can get his stripes by studying this book, I'll be a top cake someday. And maybe you can be a corporal. Now you tuck it in all the way around the bottom. Tuck it in good. Now, how's that? You've got to inspect these every day for rips and tears. Yeah? What do you do with this net if you're in the field and got no T-bar? Well, it says right here. You either sling it over the outside like this. Or hang it up inside like this. And then it says here. Improvised supports may be fashioned from sticks if cots are used in tent camps. Be sure that the net is tucked in well and that no part of the bar touches you when you sleep. During the day, the net should be rolled up. Okay. Let's go over to the PX and see what gives. All right. I heard a rumor today from the men that we're due for a three-week hike. Where? Oh, I don't know. Maybe Panama. In spite of the extent to which motors are being employed in all armies, marching remains an important part of field service. Good physical condition and endurance are inherent in health, and proper attention to personal hygiene will contribute greatly to your ability to tolerate marching and other physical exertion required in field service. The ability to make marches of considerable distance and arrive at their destination in good physical condition has long been a matter of tradition and personal pride with soldiers in the United States Army. Halts are made at regular intervals on a march to give you opportunity to rest. Take advantage of this time to relax. Sit down or recline on dry ground. Seek shade, especially if the march is made during hot weather. Unloosen or remove your equipment and support your back against the trunk of a tree. During these brief halts, if you wish to relieve yourself, Dig a hole with your pickaxe, entrenching tool, bayonet, or piece of stick. And after relieving yourself, cover your deposit well with earth before leaving. In the field, during long halts, a latrine trench will be dug. In such circumstances, each man will, of course, follow the usual procedure and cover his deposit from the mound at the end of the trench. Toilet paper rolls will be placed on tent pegs by the trench or in rainy weather sheltered under canvas or in a box nearby. When toilet seats are provided, due care will be taken that they are not soiled. Lids will be kept closed and the box scrubbed daily with soap and water and a cresol solution. Latrines will be lighted and night urine cans provided in the company street. Do not soil the ground under any consideration. There is no excuse for the deliberate infraction of this regulation. Hey, look what you're doing. You know what these buckets are here for. When your unit departs, the trench will be covered and sprayed with crude oil if available. Following the long march, the feet should be washed with soap and water and thoroughly dried. If there is an unbroken blister present that is not so full as to be painful, it is advisable to leave it unbroken. Put a piece of gauze shaped like a donut around it, and use a piece of adhesive plaster to keep it in place. However, if the blister is tense and painful, it may be best to open it. Apply tincture of iodine or alcohol to the blister and surrounding area. These supplies may be obtained from the medical department first aid man or from your unit dispensary. You sure were talking when you said nobody could make you learn. Now what have I done? Nothing yet. You go through all the preparations for busting a blister. Swell. 
And then you forget the most important point of all. Sterilizing the needle in a match flame, dummy. Here, let's see what you've been walking in. These shoes are as stiff as boards. If you had read the manual or watched some of the fellas who have, you'd have broken these shoes in. I've been breaking them in for the past 20 miles. Yeah, at the expense of your feet. You can break shoes in before you ever wear them. You should bend the sole until it's flexible. Then work the counter at the back of the shoe until it's softened up. Soften up the box at the toe. After you're all fixed up, get yourself some saddle soap and massage the shoe with it to soften up the leather. And look at this sock. It's a full size too big and bunches up on your foot. And this darn you've got back here is as big as a quarter. No wonder you've got blisters. Get yourself socks that aren't too big or too small. And when they need darns as big as this, throw them away. Oh, listen, Joe, how can a guy get a transfer to the cavalry? Is that in the manual, too? Here, you better read this and find out. I'll go get some GI foot powder, and while I'm going, you'd better trim those toenails. Cut them evenly and square across the toe. And don't forget to put on some clean socks. The War Department has published this manual on military sanitation. I recommend its study to all of you. Section three deals with one of the most important aspects of hygiene, the proper use and field sterilization of water. Many of us do not realize that grave dangers can lurk in water as innocent looking as this. But let me show you how pure water may be contaminated. Here we see contaminated material filtering through the ground from this outhouse to the well from which drinking water is obtained. Bacteria which causes disease are small and you cannot see them with the naked eye. So do not be deceived by the appearance of the water, for it can be deadly. Here are some of the living cells that may be present in seemingly pure drinking water. Therefore, you must not drink water in the field unless a medical officer has declared it potable or until it has been sterilized by one of the army approved methods. This is especially important in tropical countries. It is very important that you obey the orders concerning drinking water, both as to the amount you should drink and when to drink it. Canteens should be filled with freshly chlorinated water. This should be done the night before, if it is to be a daylight march, or in the morning, if the expected march is to be made at night. Water in the Lister bag is protected by a cover and the water should be withdrawn only through the faucets to prevent contamination. At times, especially in tropical countries, it is advisable to use additional salt. This may be taken with or added to your drinking water. Drink at least a pint of water before the march starts. Thirst may be relieved somewhat by keeping a pebble in the mouth or by chewing gum while marching. If your unit can't provide you with potable water, you may sterilize it yourself by one of the following methods. The first step is to take one ampule of calcium hypochlorite and dissolve it in your canteen cup, two-thirds full of water. Then, pour the solution into your canteen. Fill with water and shake thoroughly. Next, take your canteen cap and fill it with a strong solution from the canteen. Your canteen cap full contains about one and a half teaspoons full. Then add that capful 
to each succeeding canteen full of contaminated water. After shaking it up, be sure you wait at least 30 minutes, or better, two or three hours before drinking it. Is that right, Sergeant? Right. The other method to use, if you haven't the calcium hypochlorite, you substitute three drops of ordinary iodine for the calcium hypochlorite. Otherwise, you follow each step just as the corporal explained it to you. Naturally, if there are no chemicals available, you can always purify water by boiling it for at least 10 minutes. A little of that water, Steve. tastes a little flat afterwards, but you can always remove that by aerating the water, pouring it through the air from one container to the other. Like this. If the source of your water supply is a stream, it should be flagged, as noted in this diagram. Note that water for drinking and cooking is taken from the head of the stream. Next, the supply for the animals. Then, bathing. And finally, laundry and water for washing vehicles and other such equipment follow in that order. During the past several minutes, you have been shown a few of the many efforts that are being made by the Army, both in camps and barracks, for the benefit of your health, your comfort, and the morale of your unit. We have tried to impress upon you that this is a matter of great concern to each of you as individuals in order to maintain your health and fitness. There is another aspect of even greater importance, your responsibility to your fellow soldiers. If you become ill, not only do you yourself suffer and remove yourself from active service, but you endanger the health and fitness of every man who comes in contact with you. Some men think that it is unmanly to complain of not feeling well. They do not report until their illness becomes serious. Meanwhile, if they are suffering from a contagious disease, they may have started an epidemic. A case of measles or any infectious disease not reported in time may spread from one man to a whole unit. Therefore, to avail yourself of the Army Medical Service is a matter not only of plain common sense, but of your social responsibility. Neglect what you have been told here, and you may suffer and cause others to suffer. Observe what you have learned here, and you will be able to give to your country the devoted service that you wish to give. And you will return to civilian life healthy and strong men and in your sense of responsibility toward others, better citizens of our great republic.